Hello and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. And thank you so much for being here today for our RN and Allied Health Telehealth Lecture Series on Oncology. Uh, a few preliminaries before we get going. Uh, if you need to reach us for any reason, you can reach us at, by email at unccn at unc.edu. Better yet, you can call or text us at 919-445-1000. If you're experiencing any technical problems right now with the presentation, now would be a great time to go ahead and reach out and let us know so we can try to address the issue. Uh, we'll be using Poll Everywhere shortly, and we'll talk about how to use that to share questions with us. You can find us on the web at unccn.org. We've also got links there to Facebook, to Twitter, to YouTube, lots of ways you can find us and uh, get information about future events, uh, recordings from past events, as well as support. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right in now, and let's take a look at the poll. And for this poll, we're asking, according to the American Institute of Cancer Research, Americans can prevent, and now you're going to give us a fraction, so what fraction is it, of the most common cancers by staying lean, eating smart, and exercising. So take a look at those numbers. One half is A, one third is B, one fourth is C, and one fifth is D. And go ahead and let us know what you think that is. And <clears throat> we're going to, excuse me, we're going to introduce our guests today, and then we'll come back to this poll. If you haven't done this before, what you do is you're going to, to go to the number 22333. So you're going to text to the number 22333, the letters UNCCN. You only need to do that one time. After you've done that, then you can just select A, B, C. You'll, you'll get a little message that says, okay, you're connected. And then you can just text the letter A, B, C, or D, depending on whether you think that's one half, one third, one fourth, or one fifth. And, and then we'll go ahead and, and take it from there. All right. And we are very pleased to have Jennifer Spring with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. We are really excited about your presentation. Jennifer Spring is, currently serves as the oncology dietitian with the Outpatient Oncology Nutrition Program at the North Carolina Cancer Hospital in Chapel Hill. Uh, in this role, Jennifer works with patients to develop individualized eating plans to meet specific needs or concerns related to cancer prevention. Uh, I will say cancer prevention, treatment, and recovery. And Jennifer is a 2016 UNC Oncology Excellent Award recipient and well-deserved. And you are a registered dietitian, a certified specialist in oncology nutrition, and a licensed dietitian nutritionist. So um, let, me, let me just remind our viewers of one other thing. This particular lecture, we're pleased to say that you can receive a CBR, that's a Commission on Dietetic Registration Certificate, and so if you did come and you were wanting to get that certificate, just be sure to fill out the evaluation for today's presentation so that you can get that. That's something different. We don't. We, we didn't we have that last time. Yeah, we did not. We, <laughs> we're glad to have that. Um, tell us what, what led to your career interest in, in nutrition and oncology. Yeah. I have um, always been interested in athletics and being mm -hmm. healthy, and I'm a foodie kind of person. Mm -hmm. I like to cook. I like to go shopping for food. I like to go to the farmer's market. And those things have interested me for a very long time. Great. And so I think that kind of sparked my interest in nutrition. And then that sort of evolved into where can I take nutrition? How can I help people? And so mm -hmm. I somehow found my way into the world of cancer and becoming an oncology dietitian through that uh, door. And I I never thought that I would work in oncology, hmm. um, but I found it to be one of the most rewarding areas um, working as a dietitian. Good. Well, we're glad that you did. Uh, let's take a look at that poll and see, does this really make a difference? Uh, and if so, how much in terms of talking about the, uh, back to the question, uh, staying lean, eating smart, and exercising. So, uh, again, if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and let us know what you think. You text uh, the letters UNCCN to the number 22333, and then once you've done that, you can select A, B, C, or, or D, and let us know what you think. We're, we're a little slow on the poll. We're a little slow on the poll today. All right. Hold up your... 
Oh, oh, there we go. There we, okay, they're coming in fast and furious now. And it's neck and neck. Uh, it looks like, uh, all right, B is leading the way now. Uh, I can go home. Uh, oh, B is really leading the way. This is like a, a calling a race or something it here. Uh, it so, uh, but, but so, so what is the answer then? Well, I'm going to talk about it in the okay. next couple of slides, but actually it is B. It's one-third of um, most cancers can be prevented with lifestyle um, habits. So we can talk more about that today. So that is very significant. And it is. with that in mind, I'll go ahead and turn the slides over to you. Okay. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. All right. So today we're going to, like uh, we, we talked earlier, we're going to talk about nutrition, how it relates to prevention, how we look at nutrition during a little bit during treatment and recovery, and then also look at some, some small areas of research that have changed in the last uh, few years um, in regards to guidelines. So let's go ahead and change. I'm going to move this over here. Um, I kind of went through my objectives already. So here we are with that uh, statistic, um, the Americans can prevent about a third of the most common cancers. If we just look at some of the bigger bubbles there, breast cancer, 33% of breast cancers could be prevented just with staying lean, eating smart, and moving more. That's a huge number. And I want to point out some very large percentages and that you can't, you may be able to see if you look at the bubbles very closely. If we look at endometrial cancer, the blue bubble, it's 59% of most of those cancers could be prevented. That's more than 50%. So in general, a third of most cancers could be prevented, but some it can increase up to, you know, greater than 50%. If we go down to the yellow bubble, down at the bottom for mal, pharyngeal, laryngeal, and um, other oral cancers, that's, that can be up to 63%. These are huge percentages just with lifestyle changes only. So let's take a look at some of the guidelines. The, um, the World Cancer Research Fund, um, in addition with the American Cancer Research um, Organization, have come up with a continuous update project which takes different cancers that um, are part of that one-third of the cancers, and they look at all the research across the world, and they put together um, a meta-analysis, and they look at what are the lifestyle habits that can be um, risk factors and can decrease risk. And this uh, chart, they just came out with this chart last summer, and it's a summary of that evidence. So it's looking at the strong evidence on diet and nutrition and physical activity, um, and we can point out some of the um, newer ones that have just been updated. So if we look at, I want to look at some of the bigger ones. So in 2011, if we look at the top, we've known for a while, but it really has um, uh, become a stronger uh, part of the evidence. We have very strong, convincing evidence that eating foods that are high in fiber can help decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. That's 2011. Um, in 2000, and I can't see all of my numbers here, but in 2000, and I think it is 16, we see increased uh, risk for alcoholic drinks and the risk of esophageal cancer. And I don't know how many people are familiar with mate tea. It's a South American style tea that you drink out of a little um, sort of a metal cup with a metal straw and they drink it very hot and that tea has been shown to increase the risk of esophageal cancer. It could just be the heat. I don't know if it's the compounds in the mate, but that has some probable increased risk. It's the pale sort of orange color there in that box for esophageal cancer. Um, we know that um, for kidney disease and kidney uh, cancer in 2015, we see some some fairly convincing evidence that alcoholic beverages can increase the risk for kidney cancer. That's huge. And then there's a lot of research going on about coffee. There's a possible decreased risk for liver cancer. 2015 research on coffee suggested that that may decrease the risk of liver cancer and also decrease the risk of endometrial cancer. Um, for coffee drinkers. So there's a boon for having a little bit of coffee. Some people think it's not the best beverage, but there are some possible anti-cancer properties. 
So this is a wonderful um, chart. You can go to the American Institute of Cancer Research and look up the Continuous Update Project. About every five years for each of these cancer types, they're updating that information and looking at it across the uh, world to see what are those lifestyle habits that could um, decrease risk or increase the benefits for preventing cancer. Unfortunately, more than or less than 50% of the American population um, aren't aware of these types of risks. So they don't understand maybe that drinking alcohol and eating red and processed red meats eating low fiber, low fruit and vegetable diets, being obese and being inactive can actually increase the risk of cancer. And so this is one of the things that as a dietitian, when I'm meeting with my patients, I'm planting some of these seeds. I'm not placing any blame, but I'm planting seeds that in the future you have a, a diagnosis of cancer. Let's start thinking about how you can change some of these habits for the future. Um, to make, uh, to possibly prevent recurrences. And so this was very interesting information. This um, statistic came out uh, in the last year. So what are we supposed to do? Well, how do we teach our patients? What am I telling the patients? Many people come to me and they say, what am I supposed to eat? Should I be taking a superfood smoothie? Should I be taking supplements? Is there a specific diet that I should be following? Am I supposed to be having a paleo diet? Should I be just doing juicing? Or um, am I supposed to, since coffee is good for me, should I be doing coffee enemas? All of these questions come up as I'm seeing these patients. And so this is a it's a long path. You get diagnosed with cancer, or you're trying to prevent cancer, and a lot of these questions come up along the way. And so let's take a look at some of those guidelines. Um, what I like to tell individuals from the outset is there's not one single food, there's not one single component of a food that's going to um, increase your risk or decrease your risk. Food, there's, you know, we don't want to place blame on foods, and we don't want to make them um, superfoods. But we want to let people know that eating foods, whole foods, and combining foods together, you have a nutrient-nutrient interaction. There's some synergy in eating a balance, in eating a variety of foods. Um, so there's not just one special food. The American Institute of Cancer Research has the, probably some of the best guidelines for healthy living in general. These are cancer prevention guidelines, cancer uh, prevention of recurrence guidelines. These are guidelines for probably preventing almost every uh, lifestyle related chronic disease. And I, these are my go to guidelines when educating individuals. So let's go through each of these guidelines. Number one, be as lean as possible without becoming underweight because underweight even has some um, health risks. And so I don't want individuals to become so obsessed with their weight that they become underweight. So let's. What does this mean? So we can look at some of the standard guidelines. Maintaining a body weight, so the body mass index is between 18.5 and 24.9, has been sort of a long-standing um, guideline for preventing uh, chronic disease. But we know a little bit more. What if somebody's within those guidelines, but their waist circumference is greater than their hip circumference? Then we're looking at increased health risk. So I like to look at body mass index and also look at uh, waist circumference. And the guidelines for waist circumference are for women to be less than 31.5 inches and for men less than 37 inches. We have decreased health risk for almost all chronic diseases, for some forms of cancer, for high blood pressure, for um, heart disease, um, diabetes, etc., for that metabolic syndrome. So how do we encourage individuals to be at leaner weights? One of the most important things is exercise. So prior to, if somebody's trying to prevent cancer, I want to encourage them to, if they're not already doing it, get some physical activity built into their day. If they're in active cancer treatment, I usually make recommendations to try to stay active to the point where you can come back and do that same activity the next day and not wear yourself out. Why is exercise so important? Well, exercise is important. Research shows that it can um, increase the, or actually it regulates the insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor is a cell growth regulator, so it, it can 
um, stimulate the growth of healthy cells, and it can also stimulate the growth of unhealthy cells, possibly tumorous cells. So you want to be able to regulate that, and exercise does that beautifully. It can increase the proteins that are involved in DNA repair, and you want to have those proteins active and ready to repair because when your DNA is damaged, it has more chances to go in a direction of uh, mutation or um, in a direction that's not going to be healthy for the body. Exercise has been shown to improve immunity. It can increase the natural killer cells and the T cells. Those are part of both your innate and your acquired immune system, and that's really important. So exercise can boost your immune system. Um, it's been shown to have uh, benefits to decrease chronic inflammation. They did a research study with women, where women who did moderate to intense physical activity. And the more intense physical activity they did, the less of that chronic inflammatory marker, the C-reactive protein they had. So it decreases that inflammation. That could be that trigger. It could be that... Um, spark that starts that cascades of events of inflammation out of control. Importance of weight, uh, physical activity helps you to maintain your weight because it burns those calories that you're taking in. So it's, it helps with weight maintenance. Physical activity also has been shown to increase vitamin D levels, especially when it's physical activity that's outside in the open air. And so vitamin D levels at optimal levels have been shown to improve the immune response. And possibly, there's a lot more research in vitamin D, um, have been shown t to um, potentially decrease the risk of certain types of cancer. So there's more research on that. It's not, it's not full evidence yet. There's an interesting research um, that was done at UNC with some of our familiar doctors here. It's early research findings, and what they're looking at are looking at the elderly, um, and they're looking at how much um, muscle quality and quantity are affecting the toxic effects of chemotherapy during that chemotherapy. And they looked at, they found that decreased muscle mass and muscle function is associated with poor outcomes poor survival, and more toxicity to treatment. And this is especially true with elderly patients. And we know that the elderly have a decreased immune response as they're getting older, just in general. And so we want to make sure that individuals from across the age spectrum are getting good physical activity. And so making sure that they're doing at least two days of weight training to build muscles so that they have leaner muscle mass at the start of treatment or maybe consider doing some kind of um, weight training during treatment if they have the energy to be able to do that. Maybe they're just using um, uh, exercise bands to maintain muscle mass during treatment. They might have less of those toxic side effects to the chemotherapy. This is fascinating research, I think, in terms of the world of what can we do that really doesn't cost a lot of money to help us do better during chemotherapy and have better results and uh, recovery afterwards. So the American Cancer Society and the American College of Sports Medicine, I think in 2011 or 12, came out with formalized guidelines. We are supposed to be working on getting at least 150 minutes of physical activity, moderate physical activity. So walking a mile in 15 minutes or working in the garden, digging and planting, that's moderate physical activity. Um, so 30 minutes a day. Being physically active throughout your day counts as well. So taking the stairs, walking farther in the parking lots, making sure that you're getting up and moving about every 20 or 30 minutes during the day. Um, and then also including that strength training for at least two days per week to maintain that lean muscle mass, that active tissue that's going to help to keep your immune system strong and possibly help with um, decreasing side effects to chemotherapy. Eating a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes and beans. So predominantly eating a plant-based diet. The American Institute of Cancer Research has had the new American plate for quite a while now, and their focus is that at least two-thirds of the foods on your plate are coming from plant foods, and only a third or less of the foods should be coming from your animal-based proteins. Michael Pollan, who is a food sort of writer, um, uh, he looks at eating styles. He's, I think he says it beautifully. He says, eat food not too much, mostly plants. 
That's a very general, easy guideline, I think, to follow. And with this picture, it makes it easier. So let's look at why plants are so important. A lot of healthier uh, cultures have followed plant-based diets. We look at the Mediterranean diet is mostly a plant-based diet. The traditional Asian diet, that coming out of um, Okinawa, um, one of the blue zones um, sh where individuals have been shown to have much longer lives, living much, you know, up into their 80s and 90s. Um, the DASH diet, which was the dietary approaches to stopping high blood pressure, is mostly a plant-based diet. Vegan diet is a diet that's all plant-based. There are no animal foods at all. And then vegetarian. So not just one of these diets. Parts of these diets can be combined, whatever works best for the individual, to come up with something that in, that that person really enjoys. You don't have to just follow one of these diets, but these are good places to start. So if somebody's asking, I don't know what you mean by plant-based diets, these are some really good options that individuals can research and look at to see if they fit within their lifestyle, to fit within their tastes um, and their desires in terms of how they want to cook or prepare foods. Plants are loaded with plant chemicals. These are those chemicals like the antioxidants, um, the beta carotene, the lycopenes, the lutenes, the anthonines. These are antioxidants that help to um, improve the balance of the oxidative stress and the and the you know that we have in our bodies from environmental uh, toxins from just the way that our bodies work, and the more of these plant foods that we can get, and the more variety of colors and bitter tastes and flavors that we can get, the more of these plant chemicals that we're having um, in our bodies to have active uh, have activity in our bodies. There are so many different chemicals we, that have been isolated out of individual foods. But I want to, if I can go back to that slide, which one food, which superfood should I be eating? It's not just the one chemical. We don't want to just encourage individuals to go out and seek out that one chemical or one compound maybe in a supplement. It's how all of these things act together because there's so many different compounds in one individual food. For, um, I mean, if we were to just look at carrots, we have the beta carotenes, we have vitamin C, we have the fiber. There's so many things that are working together. And so the combination, eating the rainbow, is um, what we want to encourage our patients to do. Herbs. Herbs are part of the plant world. And again, we're looking at hundreds and hundreds of compounds. If we just look at thyme alone, thyme has probably over 70 different phytochemicals that have been isolated that probably have some kind of active uh, capacity in our bodies and at the cellular level. Um, that can be anti-cancer, can be anti-inflammatory. So it's very important to possibly encourage individuals. You can use dried herbs, you can use fresh herbs. Sometimes when individuals are having problems with taste change during treatment, maybe some of these fresh herbs, not artificial flavors, can help to activate those taste buds or help to activate the taste buds when their treatment is over and they're trying to recover their taste buds. So I like to encourage using herbs in the most natural form, in their food form, and not necessarily in a supplemental form where they're taking a, a concentration of that. Um, some herbs uh, may be discouraged during treatment. For example, perhaps if an individual really likes a lot of garlic and they're on, you know, blood thinners, they might be, you know, asked to not take so much garlic. But it's very rare because people don't usually overconsume herbs. Spices. Spices fall into that plant world as well. And we have a lot of, I'm going to turn to one of the pages here. I just want to read some of the uh, popular ones that you might have heard about. So spices, let's take a look at um, turmeric, for example. Turmeric has an active compound. It's called curcumin. And you can go to the health food store or the, you know, the pharmacy or Walgreens or whatever, and you can find turmeric or you can find curcumin supplements. But I always encourage my patients maybe not to start taking those, maybe if they want to experiment, and actually experiment with the spices in their cooking. Um, curcumin is a polyphenol. It has anti-cancer properties, and in lab it's been seen to moderate cell signaling pathways. It can suppress tumor proliferation and um, induces apoptosis in cancer cells. That's huge, and if you, you just add a little bit of it here and there, 
you're increasing those benefits in your body, but you're not overdoing it. I, I don't like to encourage individuals to suddenly start taking medications like this during treatment. Some, some chemotherapies can actually be enhanced um, with the use of turmeric. And at the top of my head, I can't remember, we, I have a patient right now in an active treatment who was encouraged to take turmeric because of the type of treatment that she was having. It may actually increase the uh, activity of the chemotherapy, which is a benefit for her. Um, but there are cases where maybe individuals shouldn't be taking turmeric because turmeric can play around with blood clotting factor. So if you have an individual going in for surgery and they're taking turmeric supplements, we need to be aware of what they're taking and remind them that they need to come off of that and be careful not to overdo it because that can increase their bleeding time or whatnot. And the same with garlic. Black pepper, interesting. Let me tell you about black pepper. Black pepper has an active compound called piperin. And um, piperin and the coumarin work together synergistically from the turmeric to really become an active compound. The piperin actually helps the body um, uh, absorb or utilize the active compound in the turmeric. So the combined, the synergistic activity of those two is very powerful. Um, but piperin alone exhibits anti-inflammatory properties um, and anti um, oxidant and also anti-cancer activity in cell studies. So we haven't done a lot of human studies with these, but it's very fascinating information about the cell studies. Um, and the American Institute of Cancer Research report, the one that on the continuous update report, talks about how garlic um, can actually help protect against stomach cancer and then also colorectal cancer. And part of the reason may be the active compounds, but then also garlic is an antimicrobial and it may have something to do with that. So getting spices and herbs and plant foods all together um, working synergistically, that's the importance of the plant world. The other important thing is, is plants are high in fiber, they're also lower in calories, and they're higher in vitamins and minerals than your standard animal-based diet. And so those are gonna be very powerful in terms of nourishing the body um, before, during, and after treatment. Limiting your intake of energy-dense foods and avoiding sugary drinks. So the, one of the obvious reasons is, is that they're high-calorie, energy-dense foods, foods like uh, soft drinks, um, juices, sweetened beverages, cakes, candies, cookies, anything that's actually made with sugar. Um, foods that are also energy-dense energy that aren't sweet would be things like your processed meats. They don't have a lot of nutritional value. They may be moderately um, high in protein, but they're typically high in salt and high in the fat calories that aren't the good calories. And then fast foods and other packaged processed foods are typically higher in sugars and fats. And so these contribute to your caloric intake and they don't contribute to the healthy bank of nourishment or, that you would get from whole foods, plant foods and whole grains and things of that nature. A lot of people ask me about the connection between sugar and cancer. I hear a lot of people saying, um, I can't eat sugar, it's going to feed my cancer. Um, I'm not going to say that that's true. There's some sort of roundabout ways when you look at uh, cancer cells, um, if you're doing a PET scan of a cancer cell, there the rate of turnover of those cells, the way that they grow is so much faster sometimes than other cells. And so they may be utilizing glucose faster. And so it appears as if they're using, you know, a lot of, of sugar, but they're going to get sugar or they're going to get glucose any way that they can, regardless of whether you're eating sugar or not. Um, what we do know is that elevated levels of insulin in the blood over a long period of time because of excess sugar intake can increase um, inflammation. It can increase the um, the insulin-like growth factor that I spoke about earlier, that's that uh, factor that stimulates cell growth, the good cells and the bad cells. And so you don't want to have high levels of that for extended periods of time because you may be stimulating cells that you don't want to grow. Um, excess calories come from sugar intake, so that can contribute to weight gain. And we know there are some connections between um, obesity and certain types of cancer, breast cancer, um, I believe endometrial cancer, um, uh, and then I think also kidney cancer, um, and then other cancers connected with obesity. So how much is too much sugar? Individuals say, well, I want a little bit of sugar. Can I at least enjoy a little bit? Yes, we can enjoy a little bit. But the American Heart Association has made some um, pretty stiff uh, uh, sugar limits, and I've had a go at this 
to see if it's even possible. And it is possible, but you have to be really conscious of packages and reading what's in foods because there's a lot of hidden sugars. The recommendation for children is to limit your sugar intake to three, less than um, or equal to three to four teaspoons per day. So that's only 12 to 16 grams of sugar. And then for women, it's uh, less than five to six teaspoons. And for men, eight to nine teaspoons. And if we look down in the left, the left-hand corner there, we can look at just a can of soda, regular soda, has 10 teaspoons. You've shot yourself, you know, for two days straight right there just with one can of soda. So we need to be very mindful of how much added sugar. This is, this is added sugar, so I want to make a distinction here. This is not the sugar that you're getting from eating oranges or apples or the sugar that's naturally occurring in the the whole food that you're eating. This is added sugar. This is your white sugar, your maple syrup, your honey, your agave, raw sugar, turbinado, molasses, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, all of those fall in the sugar category. Let's say that you're drinking a glass of milk and you see on the food label that it says sugar. That's the naturally occurring sugar. That's the lactose. So we don't really need to be too concerned about that. It's the added sugar in the chocolate milk or the added sugar sugar in a yogurt that um, can be concerning if you're consuming too much of it. You know, I like to tell people that it's okay to have some cake, it's okay to have a cookie here and there, it's when it becomes part of your everyday uh, meal or your every meal meal. So if you're having something with, with sugar every meal, then you may be increasing that risk of having uh, increased inflammation in your body. You should have, if you haven't already tried this, you should try it for a couple of days. Go and look at the foods that you're eating and see if you can stay within this limit for uh, men and women. Um, it's a challenge. It makes you really think. Limit intake of red meat and avoid processed meat. So red meat, what is red meat? Red meat is beef, pork, lamb, uh, game meats, rabbit, deer, Buffalo, all of those are considered to be red meat. We see more health risks with processed red meats. Um, one of the reasons why we want to limit meats in general, and, and we can include um, poultry and fish in this category as well, is because of the common food carcinogens that are found in them. So um, deli meats, deli meats have n nitroso compounds. These are the nitrates and the nitrites that are added for uh, preservation. They give the deli meats that kind of distinctive sheen and that kind of taste that you might be familiar with. If you've ever looked at a package of sliced ham, it's got the nitrates and it has that sort of sheen to it. Um, these can become cancerous compounds when they enter the stomach. They can become those nitroso compounds, and so Consuming them over the course of a lifetime may increase the risk of certain types of cancer, um, more specifically stomach, stomach cancer. Um, typically, when you eat processed meats, deli meats, bacon, sausage, etc., they also include high amount of salt, and salt may be another contributing factor to the um, stomach cancer. Um, another compound carcinogen found in meats is the polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons. This isn't actually in the meat, but what happens is, is when you cook meats, um, let's say on a grill, and then the fat drips into the heating element, and then you get that smoking and flame effect, that comes up and wraps back around and sticks on the outside of your meat. You may not really see it. Those are the PAHs. We also get PAHs from the air that we breathe when we live in cities. Um, it's an environmental toxin, so we're getting it from all different angles. And that also is a carcinogen um, that can possibly increase the risk for cancer. And then the heterocyclic amines, this is when you take a, a animal protein and you heat it at a high temperature. And this isn't any animal protein. It doesn't just have to be the red meats. It can be any of the animal proteins. And you're heating it at a high temperature. So let's take fried chicken. You're taking that chicken and you're putting it in very, very hot oil. So the proteins are changing and they're creating these heterocyclic amines. And these are also carcinogenic compounds. And so you get this combination in your diet over a lifetime. It can increase your risk um, of cancer. But what we do know about our, our world of eating is, is that if we eat more plant foods, when we are consuming these, we get more of that protection from those foods. 
So the plant world can actually protect us. So if you marinate your meats in a citrus or a vinegar or a beer base, that's also a plant-based beverage, it's a grain, you can decrease the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and the heterocyclic amines up to 98% just by marinating those meats for an hour in those types of things, those plant-based marinades. So you can see that synergistic kind of effect. So then I, then I, when I'm talking to my patients, they're like, oh, I can't have my grilled steaks anymore. I'm like, yes, you can. You can have your grilled steaks. Just throw some vegetables on the grill with it and make sure that every time that you're having one of these um, deli meat sandwiches or if you're eating barbecue, make sure you eat two-thirds of your food and that plate is coming from that plant world and you're going to create more of a synergistic sort of beneficial way of eating. Limit intake of salty foods and processed foods. These have been uh, shown to possibly increase the risk of, they may damage the lining of the stomach and can increase your risk of um, stomach cancer. So just in general, recommending not to eat a lot of processed foods. Limiting the intake of alcoholic drinks. Um, what is a drink? Uh, one drink is a, a 12 ounce of beer. It's four to five ounces of wine. And be very cautious. Some people have those very big goblets, uh, wine glasses that probably may be, you know, between 10 to uh, 14 ounces in size. And if they're drinking half of one of those glasses, they've already exceeded the one glass of wine. So be very conscious about how much alcohol um, or how much wine is in the wine glass or how big that wine glass is. Um, the recommendation is to have less than two drinks for men or less than one drink for women per day. Um, there is some interesting research that the that American Institute of Cancer Research um, found that even small amounts of alcohol, just based on the guidelines, one drink for women and two drink for men, can increase the risk of certain types of cancer. What is it about alcohol that causes increased risk? Well, it in, comes in direct contact with the tissues in your body, and that can damage the tissue. Um, we see that directly for a lot of oral head and neck cancers. Um, heavy drinking can damage the liver, so your liver is your powerhouse of metabolism, and when you damage your liver, it doesn't function as well. And then you don't have the, same, the right kind of um, enzymatic um, activities. You may not be producing the right kind of cells that can protect your body if your liver is damaged. Too much alcohol can reduce folic acid, our folate and also vitamin D levels. Folic acid is important in that DNA repair process. And so when it's low and you're drinking alcohol and it's getting lower, you want to make sure that your, your levels are normal so that you don't have changes in your DNA. And then also alcohol can contribute to um, weight gain because of excess calories. It's easy to drink calories, um, sometimes easier to drink them than eat them. So being mindful of how many calories are in a beverage. Um, another question a lot of individuals have is about individual supplements. Should I be taking a multivitamin? Should I be taking um, antioxidant supplements? And really the recommendation is if you're eating a well-balanced diet that incorporates most foods in the plant world and a, and a moderate amount of um, protein, possibly from the animal or world if you're not a vegetarian or vegan, then supplements really aren't necessary. There are certain cases where supplements may be necessary, for example, for pregnant women or for individuals who have a deficiency, for example, vitamin D deficiency, or for children, they may need um, supplements in infancy. You know, they might need vitamin D or they might need... Um, uh, other supplements too that they don't get from formula or they don't get from breast milk. So we, we use supplements in that case. We also use some supplements during treatment. And I'm not going to talk about all supplements, but I wanted to point out a few that were interesting to me. Fish oil. Fish oil is um, a powerful anti-inflammatory, and it may decrease inflammation. It may in high levels, this is very interesting. So research looked at individuals that were taking high levels of fish oil supplementation. Um, it decreased inflammation, but the bad part was is that it reduces the T cell mediated immune function. So you're decreasing your inflammation, but you're also possibly decreasing decreasing how your immune system functions. So that's not good. So what they did then is they looked at taking fish oil with a uh, uh, fairly high dose of an antioxidant. In this case, in the research that they did, they used vitamin E. And in that combination, they had 
the great decrease in inflammation, but the, they didn't have the changes in the T-cell the mediated immune function. So it was a really good combination. This is where the, the, you get the synergy of the foods. So the recommended dose was you take your fish oil and then take 100 to 200 IUs of vitamin E with that fish oil. Some individuals shouldn't be taking vitamin E, possibly, and so maybe by eating foods that are high in antioxidants or naturally high in vitamin E, so some of the seeds um, and some of the oils and nuts in the plant world can actually work when you're eating your fish to help reduce inflammation and, and keep that immune function um, high. One interesting thing that I do know is individuals that are taking fish oil, we, we ask them to not take fish oil during treatment with any platinum-based chemotherapy because it's been shown to neutralize the effect of that. So here's where you have a supplement interacting with a chemotherapy where an individual is thinking that they're going to help decrease their inflammation. All of this is really good because that may help, uh, you know, with the decrease in possible cancer recurrence. But during that active treatment phase, it may actually decrease their uh, chemo effect efficacy. So this is an interesting place where you want to really look at the supplements very closely. Another one is uh, vitamin B6. Um, B6 is uh, one of the water-soluble B vitamins, and at normal levels, it's at about 20 nanomoles per liter in the, in the blood. And it plays a, a big role in your metabolism and how hemoglobin is um, synthesized. And we find that individuals that have cancer, especially elderly individuals, typically have lower levels. Um, we know that decreased B6 levels can increase inflammation, that chronic inflammation. And they can also increase um, that neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which changes how your immune system may function. And we also know that um, low levels may be associated with colon and breast cancer. Some of the interesting uh, ways that we use it, though, in treatment is we use vitamin B6 for individuals that may have chemo-induced neuropathy. And so um, especially let's take an elderly woman who's having um, maybe she has ovarian cancer, and I don't know, she might be on a Taxol or one of those chemotherapies that causes neuropathy. So she's at increased risk. So she's elderly. She, she might already have a low B6 level, and then she may be at risk for having neuropathy. So this is a case where you might want to um, let the patient take a supplement. This is where a supplement may be beneficial. Individuals that are alcoholic, that have type 1 diabetes, that have liver disease or rheumatoid arthritis typically have low vitamin B6 levels. So all of those should be taken into consideration if an individual is coming in for treatment and they have any of those risks, um, they may want to have their blood uh, level of uh, B6 tested. And if they're doing one of the chemotherapies that affects neuropathy, they may also then want to take B6. One of the things that we need to be careful, though, of B6 is that you don't want to take excessive amounts. Amounts greater than 200 milligrams per day may actually be um, a health risk, um, and they may stimulate um, tumor growth. So this is where you have to be very cautious and make sure. So the recommendation for B6 is usually somewhere between 50 to 100 milligrams. That upper limit, 100 milligrams, is the upper limit for safety in general for a healthy individual. So we don't usually want to exceed that. Um, and if we are, we want to monitor B levels probably. So in terms of preventing cancer, in terms of preventing recurrence, the, the guidelines are the same. And as we move into a time as we're looking at um, boosting the immune system, we're using more immune, func immune uh, therapies in, ca in cancer uh, care, we want to make sure that our individuals um, during treatment and after treatment know how to live a life that's going to boost their immune system. So we know we're looking, research is looking at diet, exercise, uh, physiological stress, and then also some supplements. And this research is ongoing. Um, but one of the best places to start is eating mostly that plant-based diet. The diet is a really good place. And the reason is, 
is we know that about 60% of our immune cells reside in the lining of our intestines. So this is the lining of our intestine, and all those little white uh, pearls there are little immune cells, and those are um, affected by how we eat. And so keeping your intestinal tract healthy is going to be um, important before, during, and after treatment. We know that chemotherapy can really sometimes play around with intestinal uh, tract, with our intestinal tract and how we digest food, and there may be some ways during treatment that we can help patients um, improve their uh, digestive uh, system and then maybe also improve immune function um, through and after treatment. One way is looking at probiotics, preferably probiotics in foods. These are those good bacteria and yeast that um, uh, keep your intestinal tract healthy. They're, these are the bacteria that are already found in the intestinal tract. Food examples would be things like uh, kefir and yogurt, miso, which is a, a, a fermented soybean product, um, kimchi, which is uh, fermented uh, Korean vegetables, um, supplement examples that you might have seen would be Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast, and lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium. Um, all of these have been shown to have benefits to the intestinal tract. Prebiotics, there's a difference between the two. The prebiotics actually are the non-digestible parts of certain kinds of plant foods. So eating a plant-based diet is going to provide your body with those those prebiotics that are going to feed the good bacteria to keep the intestinal tract healthy. It's very rare that you're going to see a supplement that's called a prebiotic. You may see prebiotic foods added to certain food products. You might see inulin or you might see fructooligosaccharides or lactulose. All of those are kinds of forms of fiber that's non-digestible and it creates a, a form of food for the good bacteria. Um, certain foods can be higher in those fibers, Jerusalem artichokes, dandelion greens, garlic, onions, mushrooms. So incorporating more plant foods, then you're going to be eating more of those prebiotics naturally. Um, what is it about the probiotics and prebiotics? Well, we know from research on um, nude mice, nude mice have no bacteria in their intestinal tract. And we know that the, they can survive, but they don't thrive. They have abnormalities in their immune function because their gut bacteria is nil. They don't have any gut bacteria. And so we know that the benefits of healthy gut bacteria improve um, immune function. We know that as we age, we get more putrefactive uh, bacteria and we have a decline in the beneficial bacteria. So as we're aging, our intestinal tract and the lining of our gut changes. And so we want to make sure that, especially for our elderly population, we want to improve the integrity of their uh, intestinal tract so that they have good immune response and good gut bacteria. I'm coming, I'm coming close to the end here, <laughs> somewhere along the line. Um, this is a really great chart. It was, came out in 2011. It's really tiny. Hopefully, maybe you can have access to this and see it closer. I have the link there if you need to find it. But this is the research, and it's giving the grades, A through C, where, when you're using a probiotic, if you're taking it in a supplemental form. You just don't just take probiotics willy-nilly. These are very specific strains that work for very specific reasons, and this chart is brilliant. It really helps to show where they've had some positive um, uh, effects using probiotics for certain types of conditions. And then there's one interesting study on prebiotics in the elderly looking at individuals about 70 years old, and they tested their gut bacteria prior to the study, and then they gave them this biz, uh, this Bi2 Muno, which was this product with uh, galacto-oligosaccharide, which is the prebiotic. And they found that after the study, they, these individuals had decreases in the less beneficial bacteria and increases in the beneficial bacteria. So basically saying that they gave these individuals food that fed their bacteria in their gut, and it really showed an improvement, especially for the elderly who are having a decreased immune function just in general from being older and, and growing older. Um, interesting, I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's interesting research on mushrooms. We talk about what can, individuals say, what can I do now? Well, how can I boost my immune system? What is it? Mushrooms seem to be very exciting to me. So mushrooms in the form of the actual mushroom that you eat and also even in the form of supplemental mushrooms. And this is an area of new research. Um, I'm not 
you know, jumping right out there and giving individuals recommendations on amounts of supplements to take, but I'm surely encouraging individuals to incorporate more mushrooms in the foods that they're eating. Um, why are mushrooms so important? They help to really boost our immune system. They can increase those lymphocytes, uh, percentages that make those uh, killer cells. They can increase the, uh, in, uh, the, uh, the marginally increase the natural killer cell activity, which is part of our acquired um, immune system. They provide prebiotics to help the intestinal health. Um, they can increase the the interleukins and the tumor necrosis factor, all of these are part of a strong immune system. And the research on this is um, very good. So um, just to name a few of the mushrooms, the reishi mushrooms, shiitake, these are a lot of those Asian-style mushrooms that you would see in the fancy mushroom part of the grocery store. Um, what is it about the mushrooms? A large part of it has to do with this beta-glucan, which is a carbohydrate, and the more branched the beta-glucan is in the mushroom family, the greater that immune system um, activity, so the more of those activators of that innate immune system. There's not a lot of human studies. A lot of these are cell and mice studies, but still I think it's fascinating. These are some more combined with cancer treatment. These are the beta, some of the beta-glucans that are named. So lentinin um, may suppress some of the side effects and improve the quality of life for individuals undergoing colorectal cancer and ga gastric cancer. For individuals with liver cancer, and combined with taste therapy and um, uh, RFA, we've seen um, in just improvements in how they tolerate the treatment. These are, these are fascinating studies. Um, the myotaki mushroom infuses, in, increases the immune response in MDS. Um, and a lot of, I'm trying to look, I can't read very well, but the improved quality of life when used with chemo rods for lung patients. This is, this is big, and I'm, I'm really impressed about the reishi mushroom with how it can stimulate the, uh, the NHC class. These are a part of that immune, sort of that immune response um, on melanoma cells, since melanoma is such a, can be such a deadly form of cancer in the later stages. So mushrooms are very exciting. I'm not going to go through all this very fast, but why is it important to have a nutrition consult before, during, and after treatment? Nutrition consults um, are important. We can help. The dietitian can help with weight maintenance, help individuals possibly decrease some of the toxicities of symptoms. Individuals may have better quality of life and not be in the hospital as much or for as long if their nutritional uh, status is maintained. Um, a lot of research has looked at nutrition counseling in addition to using energy supplements like uh, protein shakes. And um, when you have the combination of the counseling and the protein, um, individuals usually maintain their energy level. And then in this next slide, individuals usually maintain their protein intake longer with the element of nutrition counseling added in. Um, let me go back. Um, even up to three months after uh, treatment has completed. So nutrition intervention during and after treatment can be very important. Reasons why I get nutrition referrals, it can be for weight loss, it can be for poor appetite. If individuals um, don't have good medical management of things like nausea, diarrhea, or constipation, the dietitian can come in and assist and maybe help tweak things and make it a little bit more uh, comfortable for the patients during that active form of that side effect. We use, uh, uh, for oncology patients, I think when we have patients screened, we're usually using something like a, a patient-generated subjective global assessment, which has four different sections looking at weight, diet intake, symptoms that they may be having before starting treatment or, or while they're in treatment, and also looking how, what is their energy level, what kind of activity are they doing. And if they're scoring greater than nine um, total out of all of these um, sections, each section um, can have up to four points, then a dietitian consult really should be um, made. This is how you calculate it. So nutrition intervention during and after treatment is absolutely vital component. We um, also use the um, the, Ameri the um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and Aspen guidelines for when we're assessing our patients in the outpatient clinic for malnutrition and we're using that screening um, 
for almost every single assessment that we do. And we're, we know that if individuals do get diagnosed with malnutrition, there's also, we can, we can manage that, but then also some, some, in some cases they can get uh, reimbursement for Medicaid and maybe Medicare patients when those are coded um, in the patient's chart. And that's it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I rushed at the end there. <laughs> Jennifer, this is great. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to remind folks that they can go ahead and use Poll Everywhere to go ahead and, and get questions to us. Uh, first by 22333 and texting the letters UNCCN. If you've done that once, you're all set, and then we'll take a look and see if we have some questions. If you haven't texted us a question and you have one, uh, Please do. I, I see B a couple of times. I think that's somebody who's trying to get in on that poll. Oh. B people, and yes, they have the right answer. Yes, they do. <laughs> so that's great. So now's your opportunity to go ahead and ask questions. Uh, just go ahead and submit those uh, through the Poll Everywhere format. You can also, there's, it's also pollev.com forward slash UNCCN, and you can submit that way. So is there an, an amount, what's, is there an amount of turmeric, garlic, et cetera, that you would recommend? Yeah. So that's a really the question about turmeric and garlic. So that's mm -hmm. a really good question. I don't like unless there's unless there's strong human-based studies with evidence that's using those particular compounds. I don't give recommendations on supplemental forms of spices. So I encourage individuals to maybe add a little, you know, quarter teaspoon of turmeric to their egg salad, or if they want to add it to their hummus and put that or sometimes they can add it to salad dressing. Um, in terms of garlic, just using fresh garlic, crushing the garlic and letting it sit exposed to the air activates the active compounds in it. So I give them those kind of tips rather than, you know, crushing it and then putting it in the heat element that doesn't allow the active compounds to um, kind of flourish. So I give them food-related recommendations predominantly, unless there's really strong evidence. Um, Dr. Gary Asher, who works with our... Um, Integrative medicine, I think, is doing some of the research on turmeric and chemotherapy, and so he may have some better recommendations. So if I feel uncomfortable with a recommendation like that, then I reach out to um, individuals within my group, um, my comprehensive cancer support group, to maybe make those recommendations to individuals. It feels right. a little bit outside of my scope of practice. Right, and we were just talking about getting Dr. Asher in for a lecture coming up soon. So okay. yeah, that's terrific. All right, what about uh, red wine? And we hear about uh, benefits from, from red wine. You mm -hmm. talked about some of the, the negative effects of alcohol. So I don't think there are any mm -hmm. benefits of red wine mm -hmm. with cancer patients. There may be benefits mm -hmm. of red wine. Um, because you're getting the antioxidants for um, health benefit for heart health, mm. but really, um, I I think I'm gonna stay in line with the American Institute of Cancer Research. Moderate to no alcohol um, would be the benefit. So if, let's take example for a woman that has breast cancer. Um, any amount of alcohol in the system of let. Uh, Premenopausal woman um, can increase uh, the how long estrogen stays in the system, and so you don't want to increase how long estrogen stays in the system with possibly a hormone-related or sensitive cancer. So alcohol and breast cancer may not be a good combination. Somebody that um, has oral head and neck cancer and maybe they drink red wine every night, maybe that's not a great idea because that can be one of those contact, you know, damage to the tissue. Um, that may may be a risk factor. So, so cancer, um, in spite of any heart disease benefits right. for a cancer patient, right. we want to stay away from yeah. that. All right. Are there any specific studies that suggest uh, changes to the diet after cancer diagnosis promotes a cure or prolongs PFS, or is it too late? Am I, maybe I don't know what PFS is. Yeah, yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure either. Maybe if the if patient the, uh, focus studies, what is that? Maybe if the <laughs> listener can go ahead and and uh, give us a definition for PFS, that would be great. We'll skip to that next one. What about varying brands of vitamins out there? What is safe? Yeah, so I don't make recommendations on brands because then I'm associated with a brand, and I don't. We don't do that at UNC. Mm -hmm. um, but if I see an individual that's not eating a balanced, a well balanced plant based diet with some good amounts of protein, if they're not eating a well, a, you know, a diet like that, and they're in active treatment, then I might recommend that they take in a standard 
one a day multivitamin that does not provide more than 100% of the recommended daily intake for vitamins and minerals to kind of fill in the blanks and meet some of those needs when they're not eating very well. But I, I don't really have a, a, a brand or a, a, a individual product that I go to. All right. Thank you. And we do have a definition for PFS, oh. uh, progression-free survival. Okay. So, um, so are there any specific studies in some I can't answer that for sure right, okay. at, right at this moment. All right. Uh, how can you help a patient uh, with weight gain after treatment when trying to keep off an unhealthy weight? When, when trying to keep off unhealthy weight? How can you help a patient gain weight? Oh, gain weight. Okay. Sorry, how yeah. can you help an individual gain weight after treatment when trying to keep off unhealthy weight? Okay, so the, the best thing would be to eat, again, a mostly a plant-based diet, eating lean proteins. I always encourage individuals to eat healthy fats, nuts and seeds, a little bit of oils, but mostly fats coming from nuts, things like avocados. And then the other part is, is to um, make sure that the individual has started, if they haven't already gotten into it, into a regular physical activity that they're capable of doing at their level. So if it's somebody that's already physically active, take it to the next level. If they're doing it for three days a week, have them start exercising five days a week. If they haven't started doing weight training, strength training, then maybe they need to start building some lean body mass that's going to be burning more calories for them at rest. So that might be the best way. All right, and we have time for just a couple more. Is there any circumstance where you would recommend weight loss during treatment if a patient is wanting to lose weight? I don't ever recommend weight loss during, during active treatment, treatment no. Mm -hmm. um, I work predominantly with head and neck cancer patients, so I'm always trying to make sure they're keeping their weight. Yeah. Um, but um, if you have, what if, if we were to have some kind of a guideline for weight loss during treatment, um, we'd want to keep it out of that critical weight loss zone. So the critical weight loss zone would be, for example, greater than two, two pounds or greater of weight loss of their body weight in one week. When you start dipping into greater than 2% of their body weight, about 50% of that weight loss is going to be coming from that lean body mass. And in that interesting research study, the exercise research study, that was looking at the quality and quantity quality function of muscle um, and reducing chemotoxicity, you want to maintain that lean body mass, as much lean body mass as you can during active treatment so that you might decrease the toxicity effects of the chemotherapy. So keeping it out of that sort of critical range would be the best um, recommendation if an individual wants to try to lose some weight less than that 2% of body weight per week um, could be a starting place. All right. Thank you so much. There is a question about a chart and what I'm going to do is put a link to that on our site where the event okay. was today so that they can find that. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, the University Cancer Research Fund for their generous support. I want to thank UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, specifically Mary King, Edward Bailey, and Alan Brown for all the hard work they do to make this possible. Uh, I want to remind you that we've got some lectures coming up on March 22nd at noon, Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture, Promising New Treatment Options for Rectal Cancer. On March 31st, we have our Community Lunch and Learn uh, Lecture on Cancer, When Treatment Fails, Supporting Loved Ones During End-of-Life Care. And then on April 12th at noon, our next RN and Allied Health Lecture, Oral Chemotherapy, Overcoming the Challenge of Adherence. And in addition to the CNE and ASRT credit, that last lecture will also offer an ACPE Pharmacy Accreditation. Uh, certificate as well. So uh, let those uh, folks who need that pharmacy certificate know about that one. That just like we'd have the nutrition certificate today, we'll be doing the pharmacy certificate for uh, April 12th. All right. Thank you all so much for being here today. Please visit us on the web at unccn.org. Uh, like us on Facebook. Uh, talk about us on Twitter. Uh, that the more we can get information about these lectures out there, like this wonderful one that we had today, the better. We will have the recording of this lecture in our library with over 150 other lectures. Uh, so we hope you'll visit our library and look at those. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. And we'll see you at, an, at another lecture soon. Have a great week. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Thank you.